like th- there's this general zeitgeist that serotonin is good and it's a happy drug, but I've heard you speak a lot about the fact that this is not the way it is. So let's, let's kind of tell people the serotonin, let's paint the picture of serotonin and kind of tie it into other things we've talked about. Cause we keep mentioning it. And I want to make sure people understand serotonin, what raises it. We can even segue into a discussion of gut stuff and endotoxin if you want from serotonin, but wherever you want to sure. go. So uh, serotonin is a neurotransmitter, but apparently most of it is not. About 90% is produced in the gut, the GI tract. Its old name was enteramin. So basically it was uh, it which to recognize the fact that most of it is produced in the gut. And it was known, it actually has been known since the 1940s that elevated levels of serotonin are a very bad indication, typically associated with something called carcinoid syndrome. Uh, these people produce a lot of it. And some of the symptoms of very high serotonin are diarrhea, flushing, constant flushing without any reason, without any exertion, right? Mental changes, psychosis, depression, which, by the way, should admit it there. Hold on a second. How can medicine, not medicine, but how can the pharma companies tell me that serotonin cures depression when people with carcinoid syndrome are heavily depressed and psychotic sometimes, right? It's just, these two just just, just don't go well together. Um, well, I mean, basically, so there are pl- there's plenty of evidence for specific conditions. Serotonin is pretty, pretty bad. Uh, in fact, I think I mentioned, as I mentioned earlier on, um, on the podcast, uh, the company Pfizer, despite selling you an extra drug, I forgot what the name of their, the, the, uh, Paxel, what's their, Lexapro? Paxil. Yeah, Paxel. Paxil. Paroxetine, yeah. yeah. Yeah, whichever one Pfizer sells, it's, it's still an SSRI, right? But the, on, on one hand, with one hand, they're selling you the SSRI, but with the other hand, and behind your back, they're doing clinical trials with serotonin antagonists that are curing a lot of conditions that are, they must be caused by serotonin because these drugs are selective antagonists on a very specific serotonin receptor. They have no other known mechanism of action. So the only conclusion is that if you elevate extracellular serotonin, you're going to end up with a fibrotic state somewhere, heart, lungs, kidney, liver, you know, you name it, right? And now they're doing all these clinical trials with this selective serotonin antagonist called Turgoride. What this drug does is basically similar to bromocryptine. It's an agonist of several dopamine receptors, but it's also an antagonist uh, on several serotonin receptors, but most strongly at the 5 ht 2 b So there's pretty indisputable evidence that serotonin is a profibrotic uh, mediator, right? Uh, but then, uh, you know, usually that when I've discussed with, with people, with psychiatrists, the defense immediately comes back. It's like, well, the dosage makes the poison, Georgie. Don't you know that? I'm like, okay. So have you measured serotonin levels in your patients that you're giving these s drugs? How do you know that you're not elevating to the point where you may be causing problems there? Well, there's no way because while they're alive, we cannot measure serotonin in the brain. We can measure its metabolites, such as 5-hydroxy indole acetic acid in, uh, I think, uh, blood and urine, right? I'm like, have you done that? No. Well, why not? Why would I do that? They don't have carcinoid syndrome. Well, how would you know that this drug that you're giving that is basically known as re- inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, which means it elevates extracellular serotonin. We know that it's profibrotic when you have high extracellular serotonin. How do you know they're not causing any brain damage? It's not my job. You know, if, if there is any if there's any symptom, I'm going to refer them to a neurologist. The neurologist is going to worry about it, and that's that's just the way it is. Okay, so first of all, multiple studies demonstrated that the SSRI drugs are no better than placebo. The only ones that work, the only ones that work, Prozac is one of them, uh, and I think like uh, Lexapro is another one, uh, a similar one, and there's a new one called, I think, Voroxetine. Basically... Behind the scenes, even though this is not advertised in the clinical in the in the marketing literature, but it's it, studies have been published. These drugs are actually, despite being SSRIs, they're actually partial serotonin antagonists. If you look mm-hmm. at Prozac, very strong antagonist at, at the serotonin receptor 2C, in other words, 5HT2C. 5HT2C just so happens to be the receptor through which, as I mentioned earlier, serotonin drives the production of cortisol. When you activate 5HT2C, you're raising ACTH and it triggers the whole downstream cascade. You block 5 hc 2 c you can you can cure even Cushing syndrome, right? So Prozac is actually kind of like a very nefarious drug. It's blocking serotonin. It's giving you the antidepressant effect, right? But simultaneously, it's elevating extracellular serotonin and causing wreaking havoc in all kinds of other tissues, right? And another drug, that another effect that uh, uh, Prozac has, fluoxetine, I think is like the, the chemical name, it elevates the, the synthesis in the brain of a very protective neurosteroid called allopregnanolone. Allopregnanolone is a, is a metabolite of pregnenolone, then progesterone, then 5 alpha dihydroprogesterone, and then you get allopregnanolone. So it's basically a, it's a pregnant steroid, but it's a derivative of progesterone, let's say. Uh, allopregnanolone was recently approved by the FDA as a fast-acting and potent antidepressant at even a single dose. 
uh, for postpartum, postpartum depression, but they expressed the opinion, the, the approving committee, that allopregnanol should, should work universally for any depression, not just postpartum. I mean, to my knowledge, I don't know if the psychiatry distinguishes between the postpartum versus non-postpartum depression. It's still depression, right? These people are in danger of potentially killing themselves or harming others, right? So anyways, allopregnanol. So, these, so Prozac lowers your levels of cortisol, right? Increases your levels of, of the protective allopregnanolone, but you pay the price with systemically elevated serotonin, which can lead things like blood clotting, fibrosis, uh, and many other uh, things associated with serotonin. Serotonin and histamine go well together. Histamine is a highly pro-inflammatory molecule. So, and, and by the way, whenever you elevate extracellular serotonin, because serotonin and dopamine are inversely correlated, they actually block each other's effects. Serotonin actually inhibits the, uh, the synthesis of the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. So you're going to be synthesizing less dopamine. So it's really just like the very state, but it does help. It does help. Like if somebody is about to, you know, become suicidal or whatnot, a Prozac, uh, but it turns out that it, the, the good effects are only at microdosing before it starts to inhibit the serotonin transporter. Once you get to dosage levels, which unfortunately is what's usually clinically prescribed, you're getting like a very mixed bag of effects, which is probably why in the large scale, long-term clinical trials, the vast majority, if not all of the SSRI drugs demonstrated effectiveness no better than placebo, right? And this recent study, which you probably is the one you're referring to, came in, coming out of University of Oxford, this lady who's been studying serotonin for like, I think for her entire career, and she basically said, the serotonin hypothesis of depression is done. We, we need to come, come up with something else. It's just not, it's just, the evidence is just not there, right? Um, and if anything is if anything is true, is that serotonin is actually higher in depression than lower. Another famous study you can find it easily on Google by typing serotonin upper or downer. Another famous psychiatrist and a clinician published a study two years ago. He said that um, am I the only one who's looked at the evidence and we've kind of realized that doing post mortem exams on brains of patients who committed suicide and they were clinically depressed, where well, their serotonin levels are through the roof. Like how how is this possible? And I also looked at animal studies, and it kind of showing the same thing. What are we doing here, people? Is serotonin an upper or downer? Because I'm hearing upper from the pharma industry, but then the evidence says downer. Like, like which one is it? And he concludes that serotonin is actually largely a downer. And him and this lady, uh, the clinician at the University of Oxford, are saying the primary effects of serotonin are actually as a metabolic regulator. So what serotonin really does, it inhibits sort of like the entire oxidative phosphorylation cascade, predominantly in the brain. And you're getting in a situation where you're basically like zombified. I don't, I don't, I don't have a better way, better word to describe it. You're really not reacting to your environmental stimuli, whether they be good or bad, right? So if if, if the environment is really so bad that it's actually depressing you, that may actually be some, somewhat beneficial. But that doesn't mean it's curing your depression. You're simply blunting the response of the body towards these negative stimuli. And over time, if you're continuing to give these drugs, obviously you're going to get all of the fibrotic effects and all of the other negative effects that we say that, that we've mentioned so far. And fibrosis in a in a solid organ is usually the precursor stage to cancer. Um, I, I think a number of studies have shown that you cannot get to cancer in, let's say, a liver or kidney or lung or uterus or whatnot before passing to the fibrotic stage first. So if you actually uh, uh, cut out the tumor, you basically see like almost like a gradient of like more healthy tissue, but becoming progressively less healthy to where the, where the tumor is. And around the tumor, there's usually calcification. And the first couple of layers are fibrotic tissue, right? Um, so this kind of, it, 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 since most of the fibrosis is driven by serotonin, we basically kind of get like, okay, so we're not curing these people's depression. We are blunting their response to negative stimuli. They look okay, right? They're not killing themselves, maybe, right? Uh, but we're, we're paying the price of basically really, really drastically, uh, you know, reduce health and chronic disease down the road. Um, and why would, why would lowering meta metabolism sour up mood? Uh, well, basically, the, your higher cognitive functions, are, well, of which mood is one, by the way, feeling upbeat and like uh, happy and creative and whatnot, turns out like, just like anything else, depends on energy. Um, very simple example. When people are sick, they tend to be in a pretty poor mood, pretty sour mood. Don't mess with a person who is, who is ill. They're very irritable. They may even become aggressive, right? That's not by, by accident. There's, their serotonin is high, uh, and maybe because of disease as well, but their serotonin levels are high, and serotonin inhibits the ATP levels in the brain. An animal study demonstrated that drop of ATP levels in the brain of just 20% leads to violent aggression, right? So these people are almost like they're not in their right mind. They're almost uh, temporarily insane, I think is like the legal term which they use. Serotonin can cause that if it gets you know really, really too high. Uh, 
Serotonin is now known to be the actual cause of psychosis. So in other words, schizophrenia type diseases. Mm -hmm. For a long time, medicine said, no, it's dopamine. So, and here is our proof. We're giving anti-dopamine drugs and these people are doing fine. Guess what? The most highly used drug, haloperidol, recently turned out that is actually is a non yes, it is a dopamine agonist, antagonist, but it's also a non-selective serotonin antagonist at every serotonin receptor. So we still don't have the proof that is the serotonin is driving it, but we do we do have some proof from isolated clinical trials where selective serotonin antagonists cured people's schizophrenia because these people who were part of the trial for different reasons, but they were they had schizophrenia or other psychotic conditions, they were given an anti-serotonin drug and their schizophrenia went in remission. So that's what serotonin really does. By lowering uh, cardinally your metabolic rate, and especially in the brain, it kind of basically makes you very tolerant to very inhospitable circumstances around you. That does not mean it's a good thing, right? I mean, it may have its uses, but I would not actually adopt this as a clinical, as a public health practice on a on a nationwide or even global level. Um, another cool anecdote: when the Prozac was first approved, the German equivalent of the FDA had such strong reservations about this drug that they refused to approve it. They said, "When well, no way in hell we're going to give this to our people. It's causing people to commit suicide. Actually, it's an admitted side effect. First two weeks of getting on SSRI, you're at very high risk of committing suicide. Um, and they said, no, we're not going to do it. Well, something happened behind the scenes that after about two or three years of infighting, the, the German FDA approved it, but they, they slapped a big black box warning. And the first country to ever do that by saying that if you take an SSRI for the first two weeks, you're at a much higher risk of suicide. This only happened in other countries over the last maybe five to 10 years when some very high profile suicides happen. But that's really, you know, there's no way to, to avoid tying this to the serotonin effects of the drug because those are the actually, you know, uh, the, the official mechanism of action for which, for which these drugs, through which these drugs got approved is that it inhibits the activity of the serotonin transporter, which means the serotonin deactivation is slowed down, right? And you get more extracellular serotonin to wreak all kinds of havoc. <laughs> George is having to move around to get the way. <laughs> okay. So, so how does, it's such an interesting alternative hypothesis and it's, it's fascinating. And what I saw clinically um, on my psychiatry rotations was when you give people serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs or SNRIs, anything that affects serotonin raises it in the brain, they, they do kind of, they feel blunted and they, they, they say this to you. They don't say they feel happy. They right. say they feel in a cloud. I mean, um, zombified is a harsh word, but I think it's kind of true. Uh, they're, they're blunted and they just don't, they don't react to things. So, so the way that mainstream medicine and psychiatry treats depression is by making people blunted. <laughs> That's a horrible idea. It's, um, it's a type of anesthetic, right? If you have pain, yeah, they'll give you an exactly. opioid. It, 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 by the way, it, uh, you know, coincidentally or not, many depressed people self-medicate with opioids. It blunts their response and the SRI drugs seem to be doing the same. So what raises serotonin? We talked about how 5-HT2C might raise cortisol. Right. And we talked about cortisol increasing serotonin uh, by changing its synthesis and, and perhaps, you know, favoring tryptophan hydroxylase versus tyrosine hydroxylase. What, what do you, this is really interesting. What raises serotonin in humans? If most of it's made in the gut, right. what causes excess serotonin physiologically? Well, if it's most of it's made in the gut, some, some kind of a gut irritation, which in okay. most humans tends to be endotoxin, right? Or you're eating something that's physically irritating the intestine. Um, spicy foods can tend to do it. Um, not, for, not for everybody, but, you know, if somebody has like an irritable bowel syndrome, which is, let's say, diarrhea type, uh, IBS type, type D, which is, since it's diarrhea, it's probably high serotonin, they cannot tolerate spicy foods. It really wreaks havoc. They, 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 they're bedridden for like a week afterwards. So, you know, physically irritating foods. But even beyond that, if you're eating something that gets to the, let's say, so your stomach and your small intestine should be preferably clean of bacteria, unless you have H. pylori in the stomach, but it doesn't produce endotoxins, so it's okay. Uh, it, does, it does produce ammonia, though, which may be a problem. Um, so a stomach and, and a small intestine should be clear of bacteria. And that's where most of the food should get absorbed. So by the time you're reaching the colon, there really shouldn't be that much undigested food. If there is, which is already kind of like a pathological state, and I think most not uh, most GI, uh, what do you call them? Um, I mean, gastrointestinal doctors will probably agree that if you're not absorbing most of the food by the time it reaches the colon, that means something is going on. Maybe you're not producing sufficient amount of the enzymes in the pancreas, right? 
uh, you know, uh, you have like a, you know, not insufficient production of stomach acid, which by the way, depends on CO2, which depends on metabolism. Um, anyways, once undigested food reaches the colon, then your microbiome, which outnumbers your cells, I think in a ratio of 30 to one, whatnot, <laughs> then they're going to start eating that food. And whenever a bacterial colony gets this supply of food, it increases its turnover, which means some bacteria dies, new bacteria, so they start to divide, right? But the dead bacteria, the gram-negative type specifically, in its outer layer has this component called endotoxin, which is really lipopolysaccharide. It's actually a molecule, which is a mixture of a fat and a sugar molecule, right? Now, that, that molecule by itself is irritating to almost any tissue it comes in contact with, including the intestinal wall. Now, if you're depending on how much endotoxin gets produced, and especially if this is done over time, in other words, if you're eating a lot of resistant starches, which actually are resistant to the digestion absorption, uh, and they shouldn't be, a lot of them will get to the colon. A lot of food for the bacteria, very high turnover of the bacteria, and if you have a lot of the gram-negative species, a lot of endotoxin. Okay, over time, this irritates the intestinal wall and increases its permeability. So over time, you're going to start to see increased uh, absorption into the bloodstream of endotoxin. Very bad thing, because it activates this receptor called TLR4, which the body uses to sense actually external pathogens. So to the body, this is the same as if you actually somebody injected you with like a strain of bacteria directly into the bloodstream. In fact, um, injection of endotoxin in animal studies is used to mimic a bacteria infection uh, because it activates the exact same receptor of TLR4. So it activates TLR4, and the activation of TLR4 triggers a cascade, which is associated with the release of nitric oxide, which basically, um, um, uh, and uh, by activating TLR4, it, it stimulates the production of something called INOS, inducible nitric oxide synthase, and then you start producing a lot of nitric oxide from the amino acid L-arginine, right? Um, and then also, because you're activating TLR4, that actually directly uh, triggers the activation of the enzyme tryptophan hydroxylase. And since tryptophan is always available, it's a component of your muscle tissue, um, it's one of the essential amino acids, right? Uh, then you basically, whatever tryptophan is floating around in the blood, it's going to get converted into serotonin. Uh, and it looks like the cells that express the tryptophan hydroxylase enzyme, there's only two, two regions in the body where this happens, the GI tract and the brain. Uh, so 90% of the serotonin you'll produce will be produced in the GI tract, another 10% in the brain. For a long time, and in fact, I've had this argument with many doctors, and they were crushing me down by saying, like, there is no evidence that serotonin produced in the gut affects the brain. Well, now there is. <laughs> now there is. First of all, it affects the brain through the vagus nerve, right? Of second of all, second of all, now we have evidence that serotonin actually preformed serotonin, which uh, was claimed uh, medicine was claiming for a long time that it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. It does cross it, just like they claim for GABA could not cross the, cross the blood-brain barrier. So taking GABA supplements apparently was useless. Yes, it does. <laughs> so now, even though you're producing ninety percent of the serotonin in your GI tract. A lot of it, if it starts circulating into your bloodstream, will actually go to the brain and directly start affecting the brain. Um, and just the endotoxin, just by activating TLR4, so you, you, you're increasing nitric oxide, which is itself a free radical. Guess what? It will directly start attacking a lot of the poof in your tissues and converting, generating all of these uh, toxic aldehydes that we mentioned earlier. Four, hydroxy, not now, is one of them. But there are multiple others, which are now known to be a primary component of arterial plaque. So you basically, you contribute to cardiovascular disease. Um, also, nitric oxide stimulates itself tryptophan hydroxylase. It stimulates something called NFKB, nuclear factor, kappa B, I think it's called, which is like the master regulator of the, of the entire inflammatory cascade. If you activate NFKB, you're activating cox and lox. And if there's sufficient poof around, which there always is, then you're triggering a lot of these inflammatory mediators as well. So just the presence of endotoxin, and by the way, not just endotoxin, but any bacteria will probably trigger a similar thing. The, the, the reaction, the inflammatory reaction from like a bacterial presence in the bloodstream, very closely, if not identical to, to, the, to endotoxin in the bloodstream. Um, and then um, what else? Was, oh, yeah, I wanted to say, so what happens when you eat a lot of fat? Well, typically tryptophan, the, when it's floating around in the bloodstream, is, is attached to something called albumin. But free fatty acids and only free fatty acids are capable of displacing tryptophan from the albumin. And now you have a lot of free-floating tryptophan, and then it becomes a competition between the free-floating tryptophan and the other large neutral amino acids, BCAA, tyrosine, phenylalanine, to get into the brain. Now, if you've eaten some food and it's like a decent amount of protein in it, 
then maybe these these other amino acids will outcompete with you to them. But if you let's say if you're fasting, if you're, when you're fasting, you're increasing lipolysis, right? So and if you're increasing lipolysis, then you get these free fat acids in the blood. They're displacing tryptophan now becomes free tryptophan. Nothing to oppose it goes right to the brain, right? And then basically starts feeding the the, the, the production of serotonin locally, right? 